Tomorrow, several thousand people are coming to see the rough string that was born to Buck. Casey feels a cold hand close around his heart. A big stallion ambles into a pen for the first time in his life like he's beaten. If he was a real fighter, if he was bred true to the wild strain, that big fellow should be tearing this place apart. Tomorrow could be a long day. And it was for Bronc Riders. It's only the beginning, folks. Hang on to your hats. You came to see bucking horses, and we got them. Very little talking and lots of action. Here we go. He's in trouble. Roam. Ephraim Pilch, now from Elephant's Breast, Oklahoma. Don't paw him in the face. He may be a cowboy star someday. Side saddle. This boy's taking a long time to get set. Maybe he'll ride this old roan. That's the way Casey started, son. <laughs> Folks, now we direct your attention to the chutes where the 10-year-old youngins are gonna ride these yearling coats. <laughs> Buster Nelson. Buster spent two weeks on the drive. Now, who says horsebacking will make you bow legged? Look, Ma, no hands. Ray Panson now, folks. Well, he sure has a nice soft spot to land in anyway. Casey will never forget what a pat on the back means to a young bronc rider. 
Now up to the saddle bronze. And the men who triumph for a living. Dennis Reiner. Here's your hometown boy, Casey Tibb. town of Fort Pierre seems to catch the spirit of the Buckin' Horse Roundup. The Indians dance, and Casey hopes the high heaven they're not praying for rain. The doors of the high school gym open wide, and everyone that can shake a leg joins in the fun, including old Jack. Go to your partner's right. Head man left. Tomorrow's cowboys are on hand to put Casey's wild bunch to the test. Or is it the other way around? folks. Here we go. Keep your eyes on shoot number eight. with a little of the fancy gun work that's made him famous all over the world.
Casey Tibbs plays a part of the outlaw. And he dies hard, don't he? Now Mark will show you how to get one villain from the front and one from the rear. Now, two targets at one time. His helper is the camp cook. Any wonder he's nervous? Now back to the shoots for more action. Now for some real action while the youngins ride these year old coats. Stay with him, boy. Casey says there's a young feller down here and he wants to ride. He's six years old and his name is David Malcolm Jones. A champ of the future. fellow who got on a horse here gets a special Casey Tibbs hat to remember his day as a bronc rider. Now folks, in front of the stands for your enjoyment, the Ogallala Sioux from Pine Ridge. The chief just had his Cadillac washed, so him and Casey agree on one thing, it won't be a rain dance. Stand up and stretch a little now while the Cowboys draw the Bronx. They'll be trying in just a few minutes. Now back to the shoots for more action. Minnesota. South Dakota.
the strawberry roan stud, daddy of them all. Denny Lumen now from Hungry Horse, Montana. gentlemen out of shoot number two the greatest bronc rider of all time Casey Tibbs Casey I don't think that horse heard a word I said there'll be no bad news in Mudville tonight mighty Casey did not strike out horses have been a way of life with Casey Tibbs and they've treated him kindly Born on his father's homestead in horse country, he was riding by the age of four. He broke colts at the age of 10. At 13, he rode the rough string for Albert Lopez and the Diamond A spread for $5 a head. Since then, they've carried him to nine world championships and international acclaim. Good reason for a man to be grateful enough to honor and preserve a wild strain of courageous fighters. Horses that were born to buck. thing about a cowboy's work that hasn't changed much over the last hundred years, and that is, you never seem to be able to just go out and do something. Instead, you're always getting ready to get ready to do something, and that's the case here. Casey Tibbs has about 400 head of wild horses that have to be moved halfway across South Dakota. It's got to be done by man and horse. So the first step is getting the horses ready to go. Not the horses for the roundup, the horses to do the work. These are all home range horses and they're being run into the corral and introduced to their saddles and bridles again. So that Casey and the boys will have a good string of mounts because there'll be a lot of riding ahead. But these horses haven't been ridden in so long they're almost as wild as the wild bunch Casey's going after. Now, once you get these range broncs into the corral, the next step is to start singling out the ones you want for your own strain. 
And that means doing a little ear and down and a lot of hobbling so that you don't have to chase them more than one time for a horse. This old corral hasn't been used in about 15 years, so it's not in very good shape. But it'll hang together long enough to get this job done. The partnership between man and the horse has been in existence about as long as the partnership between man and man and probably with better results over the years. How else to learn how it works all over again? And that goes for man as well as the horse. There's lots of little tricks to make this working arrangement a little bit less tiresome and more efficient. Now, when you tie one horse to another horse's tail, and that means that you only have to chase two horses one time instead of two horses two times, it's easier to chase a bunch. And besides, it seems to pacify both horses when they're tied to each other like this for a little while. Another little device of long standing is snubbing post. It serves a couple of purposes. It takes the strain off of your arms, and more important, the horse at the other end of that line knows right now that he's tied to something that isn't gonna move. It gentles him down pretty fast. Watch out for that hind leg. Now a little reminder, it's a working partnership. And if he does his part, he's got nothing to fear. Affection training, a gentle approach. Of course, he'll forget that the moment the saddle lands on his back. But in time, this horse too will remember. got a dude along with us on this trip. This is all kind of new to him, and he's got a lot to see, hoping to learn. The dude's name is Mark Reed. He's a fast gun artist, but a dude nevertheless. Well, the old tricks have worked. What with the snubbing post, the blindfold, a little gentle patting, and some quiet words, this bronc has remembered his manners. He's remembered his half of the partnership. Time now to ease the horses into the idea that they've got a job to do. Pick up a few more head from the home range for the remuda. Most of these cow ponies come from the open range land. They're an odd collection of wild mustangs or mustangs interbred with U.S. cavalry thoroughbred remounts and eastern bred workhorses. The word Mustang comes from the Spanish, like so much of the cowboy's vocabulary. The Spanish word is Mustango, and it means a stray. The original wild bronx used to be a little bit smaller than today's western horse. Nowadays, they'll stand 14 to 16 hands high and weigh up over a thousand pounds. And the cow pony, of course, is basic equipment on the range half wild and wholly honored. He was treated by cow hands about the way a farmer treats a truck. Just enough care to keep the thing running. No time to spare for pampering or affection. But the care is thoughtful. These Mustangs would roam free until about age four on the plains, living on survival rations of grass and brush. And in the old days, roaming in great herds that were mangled with buffalo, deer, elk, and the original longhorn cattle. And then, come late in the spring, the men would come out and catch some of these untamed four-year-old ponies, bring them back to a corral, and slam them through a nerve-shattering course of basic training that generally lasted no more than a week. The average contract bronc buster was full of bruises and old sprains and about as tough and invulnerable as the wild horses that he saddled.
There are two things you can say for sure about Casey Tibbs. One is that he knows horses. The other is that when he gets an itch, he's apt to scratch it. This is a story about an itch Casey got about horses. It started someplace along the road to nine rodeo championships, back when he was riding boxcars between towns, when entry fees were hard to come by and prize money meant a full belly and a comfortable ride to the next town. A time when he lost because the bronc he drew came out of the chute to look the people over instead of giving him a day money ride. Rodeo judges don't pay off for watching a horse and rider parade around the ring. That's why Casey decided to breed his own line of ornery tornadoes. Bronx that were really born to buck. But true to his nature, Casey overdid it some. He got together a tough strain and let them breed wild on the lower Brule Indian Reservation in South Dakota, the home of the Teton Sioux. The deal with the Indian agent was for no more than 100 head on the range at one time. But years passed while Casey got busy doing other things. Now the Indian agent is hopping mad, the reservation is busting at the seams with about 400 head, and the word is move them. camp is set up on Ambush Creek. A rope corral strung for the remuda and preparations made for the gather that will start the next day. Casey had his choice of ways to make this drive. He could round up the horses, load them on trucks and haul them to Fort Pierre 120 miles away. But the new colts might get trampled and the wild horses might hurt themselves. Most of them have never seen a man, let alone a fire-breathing diesel. Nope, Casey would do it the old-time way. The best way for the horses, he'd drive them overland. But first, he needed a crew of cowhands. So Casey called for some of the country's top bronc men to meet him on the lower brule for the roundup and drive. One of the first men to answer his call was Jack Hart, age 96 and raring to go. Of course, one greenhorn managed to sneak in, Mark Reed, who seems to have six feet and all of them tongue-tied. But for the most part, the crew is made up of old hands. Fred, the wagon master, goes back a long way with Casey. And nobody's gonna take Dingy, the camp cook, for a city boy. Along with old Jack Hart, who won Cheyenne Rodeo Top Money song ago, nobody knows exactly when. They've all been down the trail a lot of times. Just as sure as the sun comes up each morning, the saddle horse remute is going to have its fun. Any horse worth his salt will fight the saddle every time he feels it on his back. Nothing's better right after breakfast to settle your flapjacks in a bunch of ornery bronx. Fred was mainly interested in keeping them off the wagons. The 
The difference between a saddle horse and a rodeo bronc is that eventually the horse will give up, settle down, do a day's work. So it wasn't long before they had the remuda flattened out and headed for open country. Historians still carry on an argument about the way wild horse herds protected themselves from wolves. They all agree that Mustangs form circles with their colts in the middle. Some, like the famous artist Remington, contend they stood with their rumps out so they could kick their attackers. Others believe the horses would grab wolves in their teeth, fling them in the air, and then stomp them to death. Rump or foreleg, the wild horses managed to take care of themselves against every enemy except the two-legged ones. At one time, more than 200,000 dotted the western ranges. As soon as the wild horses are spotted, Casey splits his men in twos and threes to begin the gather. The horses tend to stay in small bunches or families with each mature stallion ruling his own band. A young stallion may have only eight or nine mares, while an older one might claim 30 or 40. The saddle mounts can smell the wild herd. All their freeborn instincts cut loose in an effort to get rid of their saddles and join up. were ordinary horses, they'd be brought in and worked out to the saddle a few at a time. But Casey's gambling his whole role that these are a different breed. He'll be satisfied if he and his cowboys can just get them bunched and moving. Casey's theory that really good bucking horses are born, not made. Oh, you can make a horse mean by mistreating it, but that doesn't mean he'll buck. The early Mustangs had the fighting instincts he's after. Many of them were tamed and ridden, but some never were. They've been known to pretend to be broken, then wait until they came to a high cliff and jump off carrying the rider with them. Many bands of wild horses in California ran into the sea and drowned rather than be captured. Casey started this herd with an outlaw strawberry roan stallion and some mares of the right caliber. Wild horses tend to breed down in size. To make sure his broncs kept their size as well as spirit, he added many different kinds, Kentucky thoroughbreds, Spanish bloods, and even one Clydesdale stallion to keep the bone and body in the herd. It's been about six years since Casey's seen any of these horses. His first reaction is that the Sioux have gone soft over the years, or he wouldn't have so many left. His next is, by God, they're buttes. Now if they'll just buck like they look, rodeo's in for some new explosions. itself begins. Horses and men, and a little while to get used to each other. The horses have to be accustomed to the idea of being moved and managed and kept bunched together. 
And the riders will take a little while to get the feeling of this herd. Every herd has a character all its own. But a few days of moving them around, up one side of the hill and down the other, and they'll know these horses. Cowboying is a singular profession, and it deserves some respect. You're out there riding 14 to 16 hours a day, in any kind of weather, all kinds of conditions. You're riding for work, not for pleasure. The profession started quite a while back, a good 50 years before the Western beef cattle industry started in Texas. There was a group of professional horsemen calling themselves vaqueros. They had already set the style and evolved the equipment and most of the techniques and even a lot of the vocabulary that would become the stamp of the American cowboy. Now, back in the time of the original conquistadors, the Indians were forbidden to use the horses. They were considered primarily tools of war. But the Padres decided they had to. So they taught the Indians how to ride. They also taught them how to rope, how to snare a steer on the run by throwing the loop of braided rawhide that had been known for centuries in Spain as La Riata, later that was Americanized to a lariat. The Indians used a horn-equipped version of the old Spanish war saddle. Once a steer had been caught, they learned to bring the animal to a stop by taking a couple of quick turns of the lariat around the horn. This they called Dar la Vuelta. Dar la Vuelta came to be known as the American cowboy's dally to take a couple of turns around the horn of your saddle as a dally. In the final Americanization, or abbreviation, the word vaquero became buckaroo. As they drive one small bunch into the main herd, young Jimmy Hunt is the first to spot possible trouble up ahead, buffalo. The bulls stand about six feet at the peak of the hump they're about nine feet long from their bearded chins to their small tail flags. Now that awkward look is deceiving. They gallop about 35 miles an hour and keep it up for 10 to 12 miles. Longer than a horse. They can stop instantly, whirl and outfight grizzlies. They can outmaneuver huskies in the snow, outswim dogs, and climb like mountain sheep and they know how to use those sharp horns. Once these great beasts roamed over half the United States in three herds. The central herd was called the Republicans. For some reason, it seemed fitting in those days. They rambled from South Dakota in an annual circle that took in five states. But by 1900, man had taken his toll and there were only about 500 buffalo alive. Now, thanks to protected rangeland, instead of disappearing, buffalo are becoming plentiful again. Too plentiful for Casey, because if there's one thing that wild horses and buffalo agree on, it's that they just don't like each other. So Casey's facing a problem. The problem has to do with time and distance. And it has to do with weather. That herd of buffalo, unfortunately, is strung out all along the length of the river that this herd of horses has to cross. So Casey will study this herd of buffalo for a while to get the feeling of those big beasts, judge their temper if he can, and try to judge the temper of his own horse herd, and figure the geography and the time of year, and take his chances. He's got to either go around or go through. But that's not the kind of judgments you'd want to make in five minutes. The buffalo show no signs of leaving the river. They like the grazing along this stream, and meantime, the Bronx are getting thirsty, and they want to go through to the water. Well, I guess it's about the same living in any neighborhood. You can put up with the noise from your neighbors for just so long. 
and you got to do something about it. These quiet little fellows were here first. After all, and over the years, they've had to put up with an awful lot. Wolves and rattlesnakes and coyotes and foxes and deer and elk. But now, by golly, I heard of buffalo again. You could almost hear this little fella thinking, we did without them for a hundred years. Whatever brought them back? Well, now that the fight's over, we might just as well get back to the business at hand, which for prairie dogs is eaten most of the time. Buffalo is the original dry cleaning machine. These dust wallows keep down the oil in the hide and keep down the parasites. A good wallow in the dust is as contagious as a yawn. Pretty soon, half of that herd will be rolling around on its back. It used to be the clouds of dust that came up from a buffalo herd could have been mistaken for a prairie fire. Casey and the boys have held that herd just about as long as they can without making some kind of move. And the buffalo don't seem to be changing their position. That river's gonna have to be crossed sooner or later. Meanwhile, the Bronx are getting a little ouchy. Now, the longer Casey waits, the tougher it is to handle the Bronx. Because if they start to get a little spooky, their nervousness could infect the buffalo herd. And then both groups, buffalo and Bronx, would scatter all the way to Idaho. The buffs are all along the riverbank. And where the buffalo herd ends, there's no place to cross the Bronx herd over the river. Waiting goes on for the herd of Bronx. Waiting for the right time now. The Bronx are beginning to get a little restless. There's nothing on the plains that smells like a herd of buffalo. And the horses know it. They'd just as soon leave that smell behind. There's a bunch of the Bronx breaking loose now and the boys have to go out and get them. They're getting restless, all right. Ponies are pretty quick to learn man's ways. That can be an advantage and a disadvantage. It works for both sides. Here, the Bronx seem to be getting to enjoy the game. They're playing hide and seek with the riders. Or maybe they think it's a game of tag. Either way, it's not a bad thing to find that they're responsive to the presence of the cowboys. Just as long as it doesn't keep them from bucking when Casey gets them into the rodeo arena. lucky so far, but this is spring, and they're on the Great Plains. Anything can happen, and even though the boys are philosophical about it, they try to protect themselves from it. Cowboys get philosophical about the weather here on the plains. A typical comment on a long drought might be, well, we're closer to the next rain than we ever were before. And a piece of advice about the wind on the Great Plains used to run, just hang a long chain on a post 
If the wind raises that chain straight out, it's a calm day. But when the end link starts snapping off, you can expect some rough weather. Well, Casey's made up his mind. It'd take too long to go around them. So Casey elects to ride straight on through. instinct in the buffalo was very strong. The biggest danger is when they bunch together and charge like a troop of cavalry. Going through this herd isn't the healthiest thing to do. One false move, one big bull on the prod, and Casey will have cowboys and horses spread from here to Thunder Asian. One bunch of cow hands can take up breathing again. Staying up with the herd. We call it night hawking. Passing through the countryside, the boys stir up a little bunch of mule deer. Gentle, curious creatures. They see nothing to be afraid of, so they stop for a moment to give the horse herd a careful once-over. stirs up a batch of wild turkeys. The turkeys, the largest and most intelligent and the most prized upland game bird of our continent. He was once the pride and sustenance of the Pilgrim Fathers. For a long time, the turkey was domesticated for the marketplace and neglected on the range. Through a lack of appreciation, he was allowed to disappear over vast stretches of his original woodland. But now he's coming back into his own. There's a fellow who almost became a stranger to our continent, almost an endangered species, the elk. They were once the most widespread of all of our hooved mammals. On the edge of the Great Plains, long before the Civil War, 
there were great herds of elk all intermingled with buffalo and the antelope. They moved with the seasons. They followed the grass. Elk is actually the wrong name. Wapiti is the proper name. It's a Shawnee Indian word meaning large white deer. And large they are. A bull elk stands five feet at the shoulders. He may weigh well over a half a ton. And those antlers will spread to a full five feet. The elk feast all summer long. And they develop their antlers, build up their reserve strength. And when the leaves start to turn, and there's an increasing tanginess in the air, eating becomes less important. You can see the resemblance to deer in the young elk. They're spotted just like the young deer. A little later on, their spots will disappear and there'll be that one-tone fawn color that's so beautiful. Here's our little friends, the prairies, again. Poking their heads up, as long as they don't sense danger, they'll stick their heads up and be as curious as anybody. A few years ago, DDT cut their numbers considerably. And of course, on the great grasslands, the enormous wheat and grain farms of the West with those long, deep plows cutting furrows for hundreds of yards, have cut down on the habitat of the prairie dog. Farmers aren't too happy with prairie dogs, ground squirrels and the like, but by churning up the soil, they do check the runoff of water and they aerate the soil, help the farmer to turn it over. But they're also responsible for some damage to crop and pasture lands. But they're funny little fellas, clean and thrifty habits, and they generally keep to themselves. And that's saying a lot these days for any species. Some folks have the idea that riding a bucking horse will break him to ride. That the horses that come skyrocketing out of the chutes one day will be safe going at the local riding academy the next. Nothing could be further from the truth. Rodeo horses either have it or they don't. Some of them make the arenas for years. It might surprise a lot of people to learn that each year some ornery critter is voted the rodeo equivalent of an Oscar. And he doesn't win it because he's a good actor. Back at Ambush Creek. Look Annie up, boys. Slow foot sure deal. I'm gonna have to have a wheel to beat you. What's the wheel? The wheel is an ace, deuce, three, four, and a five. The joker can work any place. He can be called an ace, he can be called a five. Anything in the middle. How cool trouble is that done, Fred? Five dollars. <laughs> Let's just take it slow, Elbert. <laughs> They're after them guns today. <laughs> they want them. Tonight they get the guns. 
Fred. All right, now, over two gun. Put one of them up. Yeah, them old. That's why I got three, because I don't know. Neighbors of mine back home will get a lot of kicks out of this if he didn't just poke it. <laughs> we play for go around. Too bad. Just a low ball yet? Yeah. Low ball. You deal with Oh, my God. Two dollars. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hell, that's Two dollars to you, Joe. Two dollars. Everybody stay. I can't stay on this one. You got to draw another one. Then you got a deuce and a five, you got a three and a four, now you have to have the cuter, or you got to have the six spot. What do you say with that? Now you'll get them guns. I could raise that uh, little guy over with me. I'm going to sweeten that damn thing. After a hard day of sweat and swear, and there's nothing more relaxing than a little game of poker, there's nothing else to do. Stop we'll at two in, do I need just two more and I'm up? just need two more. You'll get the other. We'll teach you this game. Yeah. Tap, tap, tap in your pocket there in a minute, Keith. You don't have to borrow something. I'm, I'm going to look any. Well, I, want, I might not even want a card. No, you don't want any card. Oh, deal, deal over. Hanger spurs. Yeah. Card. Three. Face you card. Have no, have three. three. Two. Fair little ones, please, sir. You gotta have three. No, you can't win on that kind of hand. Get me. I want one. Wait till I discard here, boys. I got the water weight. There, where's my card? Right there. Oh, best four dollars that look. I can do. What do you do? Yeah, you kidding me? Four dollars. Let's see what you got, Lopez. Oh, I got an eight. Jesus, I got a good hand. <laughs> Now it's for the gun. God damn, I don't know what that deal was. Roll <laughs> Roll him. He dealt me, he dealt me five face cards. <laughs> With the herd gathered, it's time to start the long drive to Fort Pierre, 120 miles away. The cowhands learn early in the game that the best way to move the horses is to keep them pointed in the right direction. As long as they run toward town, things are under control. For the wagons, traveling becomes almost restful. Fred handles the four up, pulling the chuck wagon and towing the stove cart. Dingy's never taken to horseback riding. Makes him thirsty. Of course, wagon riding makes him seasick, and he only knows one cure for that. One herd that's sure not inching its way across the landscape. When they settle down for a day's journey, it gets to be a matter of staying up with them.
Jack Hart rides along in the bedroll wagon, keeping an eye on things. They've been in rain up to their hip pockets, so they pick out a hillside for camp. Sleeping out is great, but not in a wet bedroll. Noon camp's a good time to ease a tired rump and stoke an empty belly. The morning mounts are given the rest of the day off. After moving the big bunch since sunup, they deserve it, and the colts need a rest. Albert Lopez is sure glad to be sitting on something that isn't moving. Riders are coming in from day herding for fresh mounts and a bite of grub. Looks like Judd's horse is a little over anxious. He's cooking isn't much good anyhow. Casey catches him a horse for the afternoon shift. Oops, more trouble. Well, there never was a horse that couldn't be rode, and there never was a champ that couldn't be towed. It's embarrassing if the boss lets a horse loose. Ever see a horse that looked like he ate a canary? The other hands have been giving Mark such a bad time, he has to slip off someplace to twirl his fancy guns. <laughs> but old Jack, just keeping an eye on things, seems to be looking over his shoulder everywhere Mark turns.
Why do you want to hire that kid for with them pinchy guns? Yeah, you're probably right. Hiring him's like losing two good men. Some of the dishes Chef Dingy serves up are a little more than mortal man can swallow. Dingy, being a true artist at burnt biscuits and raw beans, objects to having his feelings pointed out to him. If you don't like my cooking, kid, why don't you go out and get us some fresh meat? These things aren't new. They've gone on since the first trail drive struck camp. But Mark's had about all the kidding he's going to take about his fancy guns. He's going to get some of his own back. One way or another, old Jack is bound to get his hands on one of those guns. they're headed in the right direction. Yeah, Dingy. Yeah, what do you want? I want you to write a letter for me. Write a letter for me? Yes. Who do you want me to write to? To Benny Binion. To who? Binion, Benny Binion. Why can't you write it yourself? I got a sore finger. Let me see. What do you want to say? <clears throat> Dear Benny. Dear I'm Benny. Writing, I'm writing you a letter and want to get some money. Tell him to send me a thousand dollars. How are you going to get that? By wire. Where's he going to get a thousand dollars? Where's he going to get one? He's got that in his hip pocket. Well, where would he get it? Who? Benny Benning. Well, he's a trader. I guess he got it. What do you want that for? A new RCA card or something? Yes, I want to buy a new RCA card. 
You think you can still ride? Well, I'll be trying. You look like you're getting kind of old. Oh, no, I don't, I'm not old. I'm still young and tender. Yeah. What is he, a young fella or something? Who? Benny. Is he really as old as you are? No, no, he likes hell of a long ways to be as old as I am. How long has he been your friend? Oh, about 30 years. 30 years? Well, I bet you don't get that $1,000. Well, I bet I do. What's the reason? Write that letter. Well, what else do you want me to write? Well, you might tell him to take care of himself. Take care of himself? Yeah. You haven't taken care of yourself. Yeah, you tell him I'd like to have that money immediately. Immediately? Yeah. At immediately or immediately? Well, but whichever way All right, how do you spell it? I don't know. You're always asking somebody to spell. Dingy. You. Hey, why don't you write that letter? Do it right. Yours truly, your friend Jack Hart. Yours truly, Jack Hart. Casey Tibbs always says he doesn't mind going broke as long as he can do it with horses. Jogging along with his prize herd, he's wondering if he finally isn't going to get a chance to do just that. Not that things aren't going along nice and peaceful. The hands are working well and the wild stock couldn't be better behaved. Maybe that's what's getting under Casey's skin. He's gambling his stake that this herd is going to write a new page in rodeo history. get to the chutes, the crew has one last worry. The State Highway Department has turned Casey down flat on permission to use the highway bridges across the Missouri River. They're going to have to swim it. The weather isn't cooperating too much. It's been having fits for days. The river is up and the current is fast. The Indians call the Missouri the Big Smoky. The white men just call it Big Muddy. In anyone's language, it's always been big trouble. George, I want you to write a letter for me. Well, I ain't got no paper and pencil, Jack. You haven't got no paper or pencil. That's right. Well, let's see what I can do. Here's you some paper. OK, you got a pencil? A pencil? Yeah, I got a pencil, too. All right, who are you going to write a letter to? Gene Pruitt. Okay. Dear yeah, Gene. Dear yeah, Gene. I got that part. 
I'm going to drop you a few lines hoping that you okay. Okay. Now, Gene, I've got something for you to do. I want you to send me my insurance card, which I misplaced the one that I had. I want you to replace it. A new card because you misplaced it. I, I, I ain't got it. I, you know, I, I lost it. I done something to it. I don't know what. <clears throat> Tell them to send me $1,000. Yours truly, your friend Jack Hart. How's Thank that, you, Jack? George. Thank you. Yeah, don't mention it. Thank you. Well, okay, Jack. Thank you very much. That's good. Chisholm. You ever been on a Chisholm trail? No, I never have. No. Oh, boy, that was a good place to go. Yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> but when he reached the prairie, he found a new made mound. And his friends, they sadly told him, they laid his one down. Sweetheart. Our boys today is fine people. They all want to do have a red shirt on and look pretty. They don't want the boot shine. One of the crease in the britches. The lonely prairie where the skies are always blue. Somebody sure pulled the plug. Two days of toad-strangling rain. Wind, lightning, thunder, almost sheer disaster to a bunch that's ready to swim the Missouri. But there's no other way to get where they're going. Casey sends the wagons round by the bridge. The highway department will hold still for them crossing. Casey's gonna cross first. If it's safe, he'll signal for the others to push the herd across in small bunches. Here they go, across the wide Missouri, and it'll never seem wider than it is today. 350 yards of cold, swift current. First bunch are going in.
horses don't like to swim. Once they get in deep water, they're apt to panic and try to climb up on each other to keep their heads from going under. The horses don't like it a bit. They're turning. Casey's in trouble. The weather comes from the direction of that lightning. If it just holds off for a few minutes more. Those horses are plenty frightened. The only way to turn them is to splash water in their faces. That's a real live tornado up there. Casey's horse is tiring. He's signaling the others to go back. They can't see the signal. They're pushing the herd on. his horse. He better hold on to his rope because he can't swim a stroke. His horse seems to be getting weak. The Bronx are turning back. They don't want any part of this crossing. Shore is a welcome sight for both Big Gray and his waterlogged rider. Casey's mighty thankful to see cowboys and horses on the far bank.
One colt is just too tired and discouraged to go any further. But the little guy isn't alone. One of the grown horses is stuck in the mud, too. Yes, all he needed was a helping hand. Right now, that's what they all need. This is a used up bunch. Even state highway departments have hearts. After a couple of days rest for the horse in the hands and some persuasive words from Casey, somebody finally said yes. A bunch of tired horses parade across the Missouri River, riding a new page in traffic jams. This many horses does cause a little congestion on a bridge. Moving them along, Casey keeps worrying about the same thing. Will these horses buck? They've been pushed hard for 120 miles. The river crossing alone could be enough to break a horse's spirit. The weather's been pounding them for five days. It's let up for a while, but the sky looks like the rains are ready to go again any minute. The wild ones move down the main street just like they've been doing it all their lives. You couldn't ask for a better behaved bunch which isn't exactly what Casey had in mind. It's been a long time since Fort Pierre has looked at this many horses. The gateway at the Stanley County Rodeo Arena is a welcome sight, but not for long. Old Casey's hopes sink when he sees that muddy arena. Horses and men both hate it. And to make matters worse, it started to rain again. As the horse boss counts them in, the herd is split up into small groups according to age. <laughs> 